It's actually his true story, by the way. When I'm feeling low and my heart is weak, where do you go when life falls apart and the only you do is hang on? Can we let go and trust God even though the circumstances seem impossible? When life does not go the way we hoped or planned? In Psalms 31 5, this guy had it into your hands. I commit my spirit to live me, O Lord, my faithful God. We know where he went, right? Is, God face, is God's faithfulness enough to trust and believe that disaster, catastrophe, tragedy, crisis, adversity, tribulation, misfortune, whatever comes our way in this life, can that actually be part of his plan? I wish that I had known then what I know now. I mean, about a life that's interrupted. You see, my life was going to be music. I mean, literally. I thought that I would be uh, involved in music somehow, and that was my ambition, my goal, my plan when I was a teenager, and I strove for that in everything that I did. I even auditioned for some nationally known singing groups, and they asked me to come on board. But I was given some wise counsel that maybe I should wait and just be patient and finish school first, and that's exactly what I did. But when all the obstacles cleared away, those opportunities that had been so readily available for me, they had now all passed. And I was mad. And I thought God didn't know what he was doing. And all this time I was dating a young, a young guy, great Christian guy. Those first romantic and sweet promises of marriage were on the table. We were talking about building a life together. I was into him, totally. But that relationship ended and I felt like I would never be able to emotionally recover from that devastation. And I even prayed and begged God to restore that relationship. But do you know more now than anything? I thank God for unanswered prayers. Several years after I did get married, my husband and I found out that we were pregnant with our first baby, and it was unexpected, it was a surprise, but we were excited about it, and we were just settling into the idea and getting used to it when I discovered that I was having a miscarriage. And we were so sad, frustrated with life, frustrated with God. It was a life interruption. We were so disappointed, and we were worried. We were worried because what, what did this mean for us? Would it mean that I would never be able to have children? Was there something wrong? Uh, were we not going to be able to have the family that we had always dreamed of? Well, that wouldn't be the case because shortly thereafter, Jackson Vaughn Shire came to be a part of our, our lives, our first son. And then Jerry Shire Jr. came shortly after. Two wonderful boys, and they were rounding the corner from their toddler years into their school age years. We sold the crib and gave away all the baby toys, and we were ready to move on. The pacifiers were out of the house, just as I was to discover there was another baby on the way. Jude Maddox Shire, our surprise baby. Uh, definitely a gift, but you do know that God's gifts require lifestyle modifications. Oh, I know you know how this feels. When you've set out one path for yourself and you've been headed in that direction, and then all of a sudden God throws a doozy in there, something that just kind of knocks you off your guard for just a moment. You've got to get your footing and find your bearings again. I know exactly how that feels. And so maybe for you, here in your retirement years, you thought your nest egg would be more solid than it is in this current economy. Or it's that child that you've invested so much in, but now as a young adult, they've decided to live in a way that is shocking to you. Or maybe it's that you thought that when you signed up to be a follower of Jesus Christ, it would mean marriage by now, and yet you're still single. Or maybe you were married and thought following Christ and yielding to him in the season of life of marriage would mean a lifelong relationship, and yet your spouse has chosen to bail out on you. How will we respond when life interrupts, when God's will is different than what we originally intended? Mm. That's the title of the message this morning. It's meant to be, it will be. We need to start learning how to live that um, type of thinking in our lives. But before we get into that, I have this little clip I found just to kind of support my um, theory. This duck seems to be a little bit of an attack duck. Shh. No, 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 no. Shh. Penny, Penny. Come here. See how mean he looks? So anyways, just so you know, it's not just all thoughts in my head, right? So don't forget, we're still working on the food ministry down here, trying to find a place to actually distribute food. So keep those thoughts rolling, and um, still looking for some ideas there. And um, you know, we're still rolling with baptisms till the end of the summer. If you haven't been baptized, um, let me know if you want to be. You know? So again, if it's meant to be, it'll be. So this type of thinking you know, in life is going to really um, be difficult 
more difficult for some people than others. The more OCD you are, the more you try to uh, the type of person who has to be in control of your life, you're really going to struggle uh, with your walk with God. Because uh, God's going to be constantly interrupting our lives. And so um, let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word, Lord, and we thank you, God, even though we don't always understand it, that you are in control. And um, help us, Lord, to you know be a little bit more flexible in our lives, Lord, to trust you, God, that um, you really do have control even when it feels like we don't. In Jesus' name, amen. So written in the stars, Jeremiah's life was meant to be. Jeremiah 1.5, God says this about him. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Think about that. I mean, when you think about that, if God really does that with us, do you really have anything to really think about in this life? Before you were born, I already appointed you for a certain job. Written the stars that the apostles' life was meant to be, to Acts 22, 14 and 15. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will, to see the righteousness one, the righteous one and hear the words of his mouth. For you are to be witnesses, telling everyone you heard and seen. See, I knew you before I formed you in the womb. Written the stars, our lives were meant to be Acts 1, 8, but you will receive power from the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my... You see that continual theme from Jeremiah to the apostles to us? The same thing, we're witnesses of God for a certain generation. And so God raises up people for generations, and we're the generation of this age to reach here in the United States, or here in Rhode Island. And God raises us up before we were formed in the womb and already assigned our position in this day and age. All right? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Written in the stars. I knew before I formed you in the womb, listen, I know the number of hairs you have on your head. Now, for some people, that's more, more of a count for God, right? <laughs> or they have a lot of hairs or a little bit of hairs. He knows how many hairs you have on your head, right? Luke 12, 7, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Jesus talking. That's God talking, right? Uh, don't be afraid. God knows the, what God is saying is, I know the I know you by detail. I know the little things that you, you, you don't even know about yourself. Do you know how many hands you have on you? God knows more about you than you know about yourself. I knew you before I formed you in the womb. I know the number of hairs in your head. I know where you are every moment of the day. And then Psalms 139.2, David talking, you know when I sit down and when I rise. Think about that. You know when you sat down today and he knows when you're going to get up. I know you before I formed you in the womb. I know the number of hairs on your head. I know where you are every moment of the day. I know what you are thinking. That's a big one for all of us, right? Oh boy. <laughs> Better control those thoughts, huh? Yep. And David said that. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. Yeah. So God knows right now a lot of you are thinking, well, I can't wait to get out of here and eat. <laughs> right? That's why I give you food, so you <laughs> won't be thinking those thoughts, right? <laughs> Fill you up. Make, make you happy. I knew you before I formed you in the womb. I know the number of hairs in your head. I know you every moment of the day. I know what you are thinking. I control the good and bad times of your life. When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, think, consider this. He says, think about this. When times are bad, God has made the one as well as the other. I preformed you in the womb. I already set the good times in your life and the bad times in your life. I, I control all those things. I knew you before I formed you in the womb. I know the number of hairs in your head. I know where you are every moment of the day. I know what you're thinking. I control the good and the bad times of your life. I know everything you go through. The Lord is close to the broken heart, and he saves those who are a crushed spirit. You see, just like Jeremiah, I chose you for this day and age for a specific purpose. But you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. Don't let anybody steal your identity. The world will try to steal that from you. You're a holy nation. You're God's special possession. Why? What's your purpose here? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The same recurring theme through different generations all called to do the same thing. Maybe a different story at the moment. Right now, today, in our day and age, it's the story of Jesus. 
Right? Why do you? Why? And God has a question. Why do you question my faithfulness? Why do we question every time our lives are disrupted? And, and God asks Israel this uh, back in um, Isaiah. It says, "God, this is God talking. Have you not known? Have you not heard?" And God says, "Have you? Do you know who I am? Have you? Haven't you read anything about me? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, He neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable." That he gives power to the faint, and to them that have no mighty increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall early fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up the wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and walk and not faint. Haven't you know, don't you know that? This guy is saying, don't you know that? You should. You should. All right. Jesus came to set us free, even from ourselves, even from our, our, our own personal sin. He said... Um, me to proclaim the freedom of the prisoners, recovery of the sight of the blind, to set the captives free. And to set us free to the proper thinking of where we are and who we are in this world. And that we have a purpose in, in God's plan. Alright, he came to set us free from guilt and shame. You are saved by grace through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. He set us free from the cares of this world, casting all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. He came to set us free from the fears of this world. Don't be afraid. Why? For I am with you. It's a repetitive theme through the scriptures, God talking to his people, repeating these things. Don't be afraid. Just one more clip here, just so you guys know that this wasn't a single instance that I was talking about there. Tom? He knows. This guy knows. Don't mess with that guy. Tom? Yeah. Here he goes. <laughs> They're still looking for his body. <laughs> They're going to post it down on Narragansett Beach with that guy's picture on it. He said, it's free from discouragement of this world. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. He said, it's free from the people in this world. See, Jesus doesn't always say things. Sometimes he did things to make us think. Not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief, and since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Who's he talking about here? Judas. Yeah. So the whole time Judas is walking with him for three years, Jesus is letting him hold the money, and the whole time he's holding the money, he's stealing from him, and Jesus knew it. What's, 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 what's his point? God knows if somebody's talking behind your back. God knows if somebody's taking advantage of you. God knows if somebody's abusing you in some way. He said, don't worry about it, I got it. He's like, I had Judas. It's in control. Stop worrying about it. I'll take care of them. I like that verse in the Bible that says, you know, if you take care of your problems, that'll be it. But if you let me do it, you step back and just let me do it, boy. Let go, let go, let go, let God. Let God. Let God control the people. You worry about why you're here. You concentrate on what his purpose is for your life. And he says, I'll take care of all that stuff. Right? Set us free from the worries of this life. Set us free from the deceitfulness of wealth. The deceitfulness of wealth. You know, you always think, if I won the lottery, I would be so happy. Yeah, maybe you would be for a while. Maybe you wouldn't be. <coughs> right? Set us free from the desire of things. Oh, if I just had that, I'd be happy. I, you know, I actually was driving back last night, and I seen the new Trans Am, and I really liked the Trans Am. I looked at that car, and said, that's a nice looking car. Set us free from the desire of things. <laughs> Not that I still don't want it, but I know it won't make me happy. i will be happy for a couple months and I'll be back to the same stuff. You know what I mean? My point is, the desire of things aren't going to make us happy in the long run, right? Set us free from anything that keeps us from trusting his faithfulness, anything that keeps us from trusting his plan. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desire of other things, come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. What's God saying? Listen, when we get caught up in these things... His word is no longer effective in his life. All the promises he's told you of not worrying, not, not being worried, I'm with you, or don't be afraid, and all these things, they become useless because we're so caught up in this style of thinking and we're not concentrating on God saying this and God said everything's going to be all right. You let me control it. If it's meant to be, it will be. Mm. Trust the plan. All right? He tells us things for a reason. I've told you all this so that you may have what? Peace of me. What price would you pay for peace? Amen. All right. Really? And then he adds something. Here on earth, you will have a wonderful life. Mm 
Is that what that says? I love churches that talk that, right? Oh, everything's going to be wonderful, you know Jesus. No, that, that's not what that says right there. Right? Here on earth you will have trials and sorrows. some cubby. No, he was right out there. The winds were hit. waves were whacking him. And he was sound asleep. Yeah. Sound asleep. He's in full control the whole time, wasn't he? Yeah. He would ask us the same question when we get so frustrated sometimes. Why are you so fearful? Why, why do you lack faith? Right? Why do we doubt him? You know, we know what this says. We know that we've read that verse, right? He, he'd go like this. Why do, why do we doubt him? God is not a man. He does not lie. He's not a human. He does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it out? Can you just find peace in his word and his faithfulness? Can we trust him? I'm in control of everything in your life and in this world. I've told you all this that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have trials and sorrows. But he puts this button, but take heart. Because I've already overcome the world. I've already won that fight. It's over, believe it or not. You know, you just haven't seen the final outcome yet. And you're going to deal with some trials and sorrows while you're there. But the victory is already yours. All right? Do I believe he is in control of every circumstance that seems out of my control? Or we don't want to offend them. I like this verse. So go down to the lake and throw in a line Open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you will find a large silver coin, and take it and pay the tax for both of us. You ever been worried about whether you're going to be able to pay your taxes? And Peter, Peter was worried about this. He, was wor he wasn't saying anything to Jesus, but he was worried. And God knew what he was worried about. He says, hey, I don't, I, listen, I got this. Go catch a fish. There'll be enough money in there to pay it. God will find a way for you. And it may not be the way you expected. He did a lot of worry, and you're going to go, huh, I'm not kind of worried about nothing. Sam. He says, I'll take care of you. Now, I've been fishing for some money for my taxes. I haven't found it yet, but, you know, I'm going to keep trying. That's not what that verse means, by the way. <laughs> right? See, because I've overcome the world, because I've overcome the world, because I've already won the victory, therefore I tell you don't worry about your life. I preordained you. I, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. I don't worry about your job. I don't worry about your relationships. I don't worry about your health, your the future, the past. Don't worry about anything. Do not worry simply means don't worry. Let go and trust the plan. Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of man plans his way, but, but I'm going to put a lot of interruptions in your life along the way. That's what that means. You can make all the plans you want. 
You know, and I have always looked at it like this. I'm going to do this, and God's up there going, no, you're not. <laughs> well, I'm going to do this. No, you're not. <laughs> well, I'm not doing that. Yes, you are. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> you make the plans, see, but he's going to establish your steps. And so what, what's, what's the idea? What's the thought? What's the wisdom in that verse? Stop making the plans and stop saying, God, you will be done. What do you want? Cause us a lot less frustration in this AA if it's meant to be and let it be, right? God has called us to a new life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, either a new creation has come, the oldest God is new. What does that mean? That after you're saved, all of a sudden, bing, you're a different person? So when I got saved, I had blonde hair, and after I got saved, I had black hair. Is that what that means? No. It means you have a new purpose, a new plan. You have, you have significance in this world. God has a plan and a purpose and a job for you to do while you're here. You live for something new now. Everything else is just part of the plan. All right, God has called us to a life of rest. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Just deal with today. Stop thinking about tomorrow. The laborer is learning how to rest and trust the plan. See, this is the difficult part of Christianity. This is the difficult part of actually attaining God's rest. And because you can be a Christian and worry, we can be Christians and worry the rest of our lives. All right? God's word only applies if we apply it. All right? For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors. You see, that's the key there. Just as God did in creating the world. All right. What are you facing? That you, ask yourself, what are you facing that is bigger than Jesus? Let's, look, look at how Paul words it. For I am convinced, and, and, and he's convinced. He, I'm sure of this is what he's saying. I'm absolutely sure of this, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what are you facing in your life? And the answer is this, this is bigger than God's love for you, who preordained you, who knew you before you put him on this room, who put you out there for a specific job in this day and age. What in this life will you face that's bigger than that love? Jesus says, sit down and rest, let me do the work. For I am certain of that, I, I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. See, the, the work is allowing God to work on us and allowing the outside circumstances for him to use it to shape us and form us into what he's trying to make us into. And resting in that process, because that's not, a, a diff, that's not an easy process to go through. And what is it, how long is he going to work on you for? What does that say? Until you go home. You're a continual work in progress to the day you go. You never, there's no retirement in Christianity. No retirement. To the day you go home, you're here for a specific purpose in my plan. And the longer you're here, the more time he's had working on you. The more effective you can be. All right? Here, look at his example. Rest at the feet of Jesus. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now, she had a sister called Mary who, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. I'm going to read her for that verse. She had a sister named Mary who just sat at the Lord's feet and did absolutely nothing but listen to Jesus. All right? She took, that sounds kind of easy, but look what Martha was doing. Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made to the point where she was so frustrated, she's going to come over and chew out Jesus. She came and asked him, Lord, don't you even understand that my sister's just sitting there doing absolutely nothing while I go around and do everything for everybody? What did Jesus say? Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about a lot of things in your life. Are you worried and upset about a lot of things in your life? Are you missing what Mary understood that Martha didn't? But few things are needed, and indeed only one. Only one. And Mary has chosen the better, and it will not be taken away from her. Slow down, Martha. Learn. Get at my feet and rest. You see, what did I tell you? you listen, we have two women... The Lord's both in their lives. One chose the life of rest and one chose the life of worry and frustration. All right? The one thing God tells us to seek comes with the promise of what all the other stuff would seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. And that's what Mary chose. And then, you know what? I'll take care of the rest. And you know what? You'll be able to rest and find that peace. 
So many of our problems are created because we're doing things backward. See, we seek God for the wrong reasons, and that's why it doesn't work. We're seeking God to fix our problems and get the stuff we want. Right? And we think he'll give us everything we need, and then we'll be satisfied, and these things will make us happy. That's not what he said. He said to seek him first. Seek your purpose that he has for you first. And then I'll take care of the rest. It's actually opposite of the way our minds would work. Seek God first and do do this with the key as a state of mind in which one is troubled, worried, anxiety, or concerned. And so remember, you have to be seeking God first, then give him all this and give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. And so the next verse is very significant when you read this. All right? The enemy will attack you through your mind. Um, it, it, it try to make you worry, try to make you kind of try to want to control your life. And he does this in different ways, right? Uh, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. All right, so remember now, this enemy is going to try to attack. Anything that God says, he'll try to attack. Um, be alert and sober mind your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And the, and the way he attacks us is through our minds. All right, he'll lie to you. All right, so just remember that he will lie to you. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding the truth, for there is listen, there's no truth in him. Now, I'm going to show you in a, in a second how to recognize when he's talking to you. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Now, the thing is, you can't see him. Right? So how do you recognize when he's working in your life? This is what he'll do. I'll tell you this. If you're walking around worried, fear, full of fear and anxiety, he's working on you. Because God told you not to do those things. And so whenever you, you're reacting in a way that's outside of this book, you need to recognize that that's not God, that's the enemy. Whenever you're desiring things that go outside this book, you need to recognize that's not God, that's the enemy. That's how he works. All right? So he's, he's working in all our lives. And whatever he tells you is a lie. He'll tell you you're missing out. That's what he told out of me. For God knows that when you eat from, uh, that your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Wow, if you just had this, you would be so happy and everything would be perfect in your life. Well, how did that work out for Adam and Eve? Did that really, did that really come out pretty good for them in the end? No, anything he offers you that, that it goes outside of God's word is, is, you, is probably going to hurt you down the road. He'll try to make you live your life in fear. For, but what does God say? For God does not give us the spirit of fear. So when you walk in your life and you, we're afraid, I just what I do. When I start feeling fear, I go, you know what? That's not God. That's not because God, this is what God gives, but power and love and what? It's not mine. Yeah, so you know what? When, I, when, when those things are off in our lives, it's because the enemy is messing with our heads. And so these are how ways we spot him speaking to us or working in our lives. All right, he'll remind you of your past. You ever go, wow, oh, man, I wish I could go back and redo that one, mm. right? For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. God doesn't remember your past. He doesn't forgive you of your sins. That's a, the difference between us, like, I can forgive you if you offend me, but, you know, no matter how hard I try, I always remember it, right? And so as much as sometimes we want to completely let things go, people, our memories stir things up. But God doesn't work that way. So when you bring things up with God that you did before, he goes, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? God doesn't lie. He just forgives and forgets. So it's about human forgiveness. And so anytime you start going in past, well, I wish that God's going, what are you even thinking about? Because remember, he knows your thoughts. That's the enemy. He's reminding you, right? Tell, tell you that God doesn't care. Well, God says, uh, you keep track of all my sorrows. You've collected all my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. Every difficult thing that you go through in this life, God has penned it down. He'll tell you that you're alone. You ever feel lonely? Matthew 28, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, the key to that verse is low. Remember, so stay off plains and stay off mountains. Because God's not with you in those places, right? So keep, you know, you know, keep, keep it low, yeah, right? Hmm, doesn't say that. You know? It's L-O, not L-O-W. Oh. <laughs> keep it low, guys. Keep it low. You're on your own if you're up there. 
And we tell you, death is the end instead of a new beginning. First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 4. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to believers who have died. Why? So you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him believers who have died. We don't die. We just go to a different place, a much better place. Amen. Mm. Right? He'll say you can't. You can't quit the addictions. You can't win. The situation is impossible that you're in. You know what God says? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I love that verse where God says, what, what is it I can't do? What is, what is it? Why, why do we question them? He pots red seas. <laughs> Brings dead back to life. God does the impossible. Why, why do we question them, right? God will make a way when there seems to be no way. Right? The battle will always be in our mind. Listen, it's a labor to rest because it requires constant alert of our thoughts and our emotions. It requires a constant reminder of what God said over what we're feeling and what's going on in our lives. But God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of love in our sound life. All right, it's a labor to trust. I said, it's work to trust God. Said, Sometimes things happen to you, like, you're like, what the heck, God? And you go, all right, all right, I'm going to trust you're in control. You don't understand it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. What does it say in the next part? Stop trying to figure it out. Because you're not going to be able to figure it out. Things are going to happen. You're going like, this doesn't make any sense at all. God's saying, stop trying to figure it out. It's part of the plan. Always has been part of the plan. It was part of the plan before you got here. Trust in that the bad things have a purpose in this plan. Even our screw-ups he'll use. Right? I, like, I like looking back sometimes, you know, David and Bathsheba, you know the story, right? I remember the first time I read that, I actually was like, is this the same guy? Because we have this guy who's extremely in love with God, and then over there he is uh, committing adultery. Not, not just that he committed adultery, but then he killed the guy that he committed adultery with to cover it up. And I'm saying, is this the same guy? Yeah. Now, he did that, that great crime and that great sin before God, but who did God pick to be the second king after David? Well, third, this would be the third king, actually. Solomon, right? Who's, 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 who's Solomon's mom? Bathsheba. Right. Isn't that weird how he picks that? Like, something that you think was so bad in your life, he actually uses it down the road for good. Because you know why? Because when you say, God, forgive me, he forgets it. And he just moves on with your life. And when we go back, we torture ourselves over the things we've done or things that have happened to us. And it was all part of his plan. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good. The question is, do we know that? You know, we question it all the time, don't we? For those that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And they, you know, the only qualification I see in that verse is, do you love God? And if you do, then everything's going to work for, together for good. Do you love Everything you had a purpose from your past, your present, and your future. This is from John 16, now verse 33. Jesus says, now I've told you these things. That's interesting. He says, I've told you these things, including all the negative things. You're going to have a hard, hard time in this world. And he talks about persecution. He's given them some prophecies. And he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Hmm. Usually when we read the news or we tell each other about all the negative stuff, did you hear this happen to so-and-so? Have you heard what's happened in this country? Do you know that? That's not our mechanism for engendering peace in the hearts of people. But Jesus has told them all the negative stuff that is happening and that is going to happen. He's prophesied disaster and says, I told you these things so that you'll have peace in me. The world is destabilizing. But Jesus says, I want you to know that through all of that, there is one central source of peace, that you'll have peace in me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. There he goes again. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Past tense, it's already happened. I've conquered the world. I've given you a better way. You are children of the kingdom. You are citizens of a different way of living, of a, 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 a multi
multi-ethnic transnational kingdom of a way of being in this world uh, that, that has already achieved a victory in one sense. We have achieved a victory that unites us in a beautiful way and that empowers us to make a difference in ways that maybe we couldn't as single individuals to encourage one another to take the right steps forward. Uh, be encouraged, find peace in Jesus, and know that he's already overcome the world. Uh, we are kingdom citizens now with a job to do. And that can be, uh, that can be inspiring. And it can be beautiful. It can certainly be a loving way of living together. That can be inspiring. That can be beautiful. The, the thing is, you know, <clears throat> It's not just that we understand that God has a job for us, it's for us to learn to love the job, that to be that, the, the inspiration of our lives, the passion, and change the passions that we're chasing in this world to the passions of chasing this God and his purpose and his plan. God says to seek him first, that's what that means. And when you're seeking me, just all those things that are really making you worry, just, just throw them on me, I'll take care of those things. And just trust the plan. Trust that I'm in control. Stop worrying about your life. Trust I was in control before you got here. I planned this before you even arrived. Then, listen, Philippians 4, 7 says this, then, then, when you get to that point of your Christian walk, then you will experience God's peace. And see, that's what I mean. It, it, this, the steps, just, just because you're a Christian, it's not promised to you. God's word has to be applied to our lives. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. Wow, how can that person be so content when life is so disruptive? All right? His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. See, maybe we will, maybe we won't. That's the attitude we have to have. You know, I'm going to do this, but you know what, God, you will be done. So be it. Everything else in our lives, relationships, with all the things that cause us a lot of this grief, if it's meant to be, it'll be. I'm just going to worry about my relationship with this God. All right, Proverbs, the book of wisdom says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean, or not depend on your own understanding. Lean means to incline, deviate, or bend from a vertical position. That means when you start taking your focus off here and you start leaning down things here to keep yourself up. Don't lean. Don't do that, God's saying. That's not wise. The book of Wisdom says that's not wise. Base your life on this book. And what God says. Everything else, if it's meant to be, let it be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that um, yeah, we can trust you. Help us to, Lord, do the labor, Lord, and remind ourselves constantly <coughs> so that we'll do those things, God. Uh, everything else in our lives. If it's meant to be, let it be. And if not, then don't let it happen. And we ask and pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's it, guys. <laughs>